Hello, this is Clint Halstead, and this is an internet course called Introduction to Microprocessors. I'm using the following textbook you can see on the screen, and we're going to provide a survey of the following topics in this lesson. Interrupts and timers, keypads and LCDs, Beyond the PIC 16F84, Capture, Compare, and PWM module, Serial ports, and Analog to Digital Converters. So the first thing I want to talk about is why are we doing a survey of all these topics? I'm going to try to get through all these topics in one lesson. I'm going to try to make it as short as possible, but why do I want to go so fast through this? Well, because this is a this is a limited this is a 16 week course. We have limited time. We don't have time to talk about all these in detail. This would move into another semester. I want this to be a project-based learning uh, microprocessor course which means I want uh, the students to pick a project and project and then decide which peripherals they need to learn about. Not every project requires every peripheral. So instead of learning everything there is to know about microprocessors, let's just learn the things that you're, you're going to need for your particular project. That way we can save a lot of time. We can save you know, possibly an entire semester by just picking the peripherals that we want to learn about. The first thing you need to do is to pick a project. You can go to elance.com and you can actually get paid to do a project, but I wouldn't suggest this for the first time for your first project. This would be something more advanced that you would probably want to do, but you could get some ideas off of Elance. This is a freelance website where you can get paid to do some, some working, uh, to, to do some embedded design. You can work with local employers or you can just come up with your own project. Or you can look on the internet, do some searches. Uh, you can work with some faculty uh, or whatever you would like to do to pick a project. So first I'm going to talk about interrupts and timers. And if you don't need to use interrupts and timers, then, then you don't really need to learn about these. So I'm just going to go over quickly what are interrupts and timers and then you can make the decision on where whether you need to go more in depth in this topic. <clears throat> okay, so this is an example block diagram of the PIC-16F84A and so far we've talked about pretty much everything that exists in this microprocessor and this is why we picked this particular device is because it's pretty simple and you can learn about the entire th uh, chip in one semester. The only thing we haven't really learned about is the interrupt. What is this INT? That's an inter interrupt. And then also we want to talk about the timer. So what is an interrupt? An interrupt is a way to interrupt the microprocessor from doing what it's currently doing to doing something different. Okay, so for example, um, you, have, you have a timer overflow can cause an interrupt. And you can also have um, an interrupt flag. You can have an external interrupt. You can have a port B change on uh, when there's a change on port B inputs that can cause an interrupt. Or you can have an EEPROM write complete. So that can cause an interrupt. A lot of these things you don't want to continuously pull or continuously check uh, the value, whether the port B is changed or whether your EEPROM is done writing. You, you just want to, to execute your code and if, if an event occurs on that, then you want to cause the microprocessor to stop. It's equivalent to kind of tapping the microprocessor on the shoulder and saying, hey, can you, I need you to service me. I need you to look at the data that I have to provide for you. So if that's something that you think your project needs, then you, you're going to want to investigate a little bit more on what an interrupt is, how they work. You also have a global interrupt enable and an external interrupt input. How do you control this register? Well, there's a register called int con, interrupt control register. 
And this is what you'll need to use in order to use interrupts. And you, you'll have to research this and learn a little bit more about how they work. I'm not going to go over the details right now. For, uh, for, for time limits, I want to make this just a quick survey so you can get an idea of what it is that you're going to need. Just really quickly though, how does the, a little bit more detail about how an interrupt works. An interrupt is detected. You complete the current instruction. You save the counter on the stack. You clear the global interrupt enable. This is so you don't get any more interrupts. You load the program counter with 0004A. So that means you go to this, res this uh, uh, interrupt vector. And then you continue program execution and then you wait to get this return from interrupt instruction. So you have to use this command in your code. And if you don't get that, then you just continue executing your interrupt service routine. If you do get the return from interrupt, then you set your, you enable your global interrupts back to a one so you can re start receiving new interrupts. And then you load the PC from the stack and then you continue where you left off. That's basically the way that the interrupt process works in the PIC-16. And just a little quick piece of information to help you get started with a single interrupt. Uh, the first thing you're going to need to do is start the interrupt service routine at the interrupt vector location uh, 4 in your code. You can use the org command which is a similar directive to set that location. So you just use that in combination with some go to statements as well. Enable the interrupt that is to be used by setting the int con register and or the PIE registers. Set the global enable bit inside that register. And once in the interrupt service routine, you clear the interrupt flag. You end the interrupt service routine with return from interrupt instruction. Ensure that the in interrupt source, for example, port B or timer, is actually set up to generate interrupts. Here's an example really quickly of how to do an interrupt. Um, you want to have your regular program code. The first thing you're going to do is have org 0 and then go to start. This will be your regular program code. And then start will, will jump past your interrupt service routine. So this is going to jump past your interrupt service routine. And your normal code will just start like this. But if you do get an interrupt, <coughs> it's going to immediately go to location 4 which is your interrupt vector for the PIC 16 series. Now it's going to say go to interrupt routine so you can have um, you can have your interrupt service routine down here so it's going to jump. So that's the basic way of how you would set that up. Again for more information you're just going to have to read and research. Uh, I suggest you know the book that I described before and just going to chapter 6 and reading that and there's lots of example code that you can use off of the off the website. <clears throat> now we'll learn a little bit about the timer module. Why do you need a timer? Well there's the the PIC microchip has a a timer so if you need to do anything having to do that with very precise timing because you never know when your code how long your code is going to to uh, run. So if you need to do something that's very, very timing intensive like PWM or uh, anything that's just really you're counting, you're doing something where you're trying to count how many something happened in a certain amount of time, you're probably going to need a timer module. This timer, you can set this timer up, you can have an external pin here and it has a, a register that you can load, preload all these uh, prescale timers and you can you can execute code in a very precise amount of time. So if that's something you think you may need, the timer zero module is something that you would probably want to research. And it does have a, a register that's used to configure it. It's called the option register. And you can see here the PS2, PS1, PS0, that's the prescale bit. So you can read here and read in your book, again, in chapter 6, to learn more about that. <clears throat> uh, section 6.3 and then 6.4. Also the watchdog timer and the sleep mode you can read more about it. If you, if you want to have something where if your code locks up 
and you want to have a way to get out of that code, then you can enable the watchdog timer. Now we're going to talk about keypads and LCDs. If you have a project that you believe would need a keypad or an LCD, then I'll just describe really quickly how, how those would work. So if you need to input information, uh, ones and zeros, you know, numbers, possibly uh, characters, um, then you could try to use a, a keypad. Now, a keypad works by um, basically ha having rows and columns. So you make you make the keypad uh, out of rows and then you, columns, and you connect those to your port B or port A or whatever bits you may have on the fix 16 f 84 a This would probably be connected to port B because you, you're going to need, in this case, seven bits. And you can see here that you have a pull-up resistor on each line and then you can see that each uh, switch is associated with both a row and a column. So when you press a button, what happens when you press a button is it grounds this this line. And for example, if you press one, it's going to ground, it's going to pull seven and three low. And then you can decode that if you look on this table, um, seven and three. So seven right here, 7 and 3. You can see that this is bit 7, this is 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So in 7 and 3, when these are zeros, you know that you have a 1. So you can go through that matrix and you can tell exactly uh, what key has been pressed. So that's basically the way a keypad works. It, you, you just connect it to your, your parallel port. If you want more information, again, just read the section in the textbook on chapter 8. And then you have some code here you can pull off the website to exa some example code on, on how that works. <clears throat> now, there may be some situations where you want to have an LCD. You may want to display some information. I, I once did a project where I, I used a u ultrasound to send out pulses and then I would I would measure the distance the time it took for that pulse to, to come back to me and then I would use uh, the, the distance that sound travels in air in order to calculate the distance so basically it was a, a distance measure and so I would output the distance on the LCD in, in meters or feet um, you may want to output some values on an analog to digital converter or something like that so let's talk a little bit about how that would work Basically, the way it works is you, the LCDs, they come, a lot of them come with uh, a parallel port. Some of them come with a serial port. Um, but for now, let's just talk about the ones that come with a parallel port. We'll talk about serial ports later. Um, there's a specific one called a Hitachi HD44780 that's very popular. And it's kind of a classic one. And it's controlled by either 8 or 4 bits of data and then 3 bits of, of control signals. Um, the control signals are read, write, E, which is basically your clock, and then your RS signal. And then you have you can either do four bits of data or you can do eight. If you if you want to save some some data lines, you can go to four bits of data. Okay, so <clears throat> every data transfer is enabled by a pulse on the E line, E going high, with RS set low. The data on the bus is interpreted as an instruction. So the RS tells you whether it's an instruction or, or data. And of course the RW is read, write. Uh, read, high, write, low. And so that's basically the way we can see here on the screen. You have your clock as your E-line, you have your data, and that's how you communicate with that interface. And of course there's some code that you can pull off the website, embedded know-how, website and there's lots of code you could probably find on the internet uh, in order to, to write to LCD. If you have multi-sim there's an excellent example in multi-sim software that, that does a uh, character display as well. Lots of examples out there. So now that we've talked about uh, the keypads, the LCD and interrupts and timers we're pretty much maxed out the capabilities of the PIC16F84 
Let's talk a little bit more about advanced peripherals. What if we want to go beyond the 16F84? You can see here, this is the block diagram of the 16F84. We've covered every peripheral on here. We've covered the timer, uh, the interrupt service routine we, we talked about, how the W registers works, the, the flash instruction register, how to do the coding inside of here. Um, and we, we've been using the PICDEM lab. The PICDEM lab is a very nice uh, evaluation kit to use because you can pretty much use, you can use uh, any PIC microchip on this kit, almost any one, because you can just take the chip and just plug it right in this board. Even the ones that don't, that don't fit in the, the regular sockets, you can just plug directly into the uh, solderless breadboard and you can wire it up to its uh, debug pins and you can you can make it work. But the ones that we have in our pick dim lab, the more advanced ones are the next level up is the 88 and then the 690. Let's look really quick at those. The 88, what does it what does it add? Well you can see here it adds more timers. Um, it adds a UART, which you don't really know what that is yet. It adds a CCP. We're going to talk about each one of these. It adds comparators. It adds a 10-bit analog to digital converter and it add, adds a synchronous serial port. So you get lots of new features when you when you jump up to the 88 part. And when you jump up to the 690, you get even more. Now you get a 12-bit analog to digital converter. You get some analog comparators and reference. You get a CCP, which is uh, this one has a CP, CP as well. This has an enhanced one, and we're talking about this more later. This is a comparator com uh, and uh, PWM. This is a synchronous serial port. Again, a UART. You got more timers. You got it says ultra uh, sleep mode. So those are some of the advanced features you're going to get on the some of the 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 more advanced chips. So let's talk really quickly about this first module that we talked about, the CCP, CCP1, and then this uh, enhanced CCP. Okay, so the capture and compare module. The capture and com compare module allows you to do uh, capture and digital capture and uh, PWM type signals, and we'll talk about a little bit what that is later. It has a con a register here that you can use to configure it. So the ca the capture mode operates like a stopwatch when an event occurs. The value indicated by a running clock is recorded in a stopwatch. The watch then stops running. In a capture register, the clock goes on running, but its value at the instant when the event occurs is captured. The CCP1 in the capture mode is shown. As well as causing a capture to occur, the occurrence of the event can also cause an interrupt. Okay, so um, that's, that's the capture mode. And then the compare mode is is a module that in the compare mode, the CCP1 module has a digital comparator, which continuously compares the value of a timer with the 16-bit register made up of CCPR1H and CCPR1 low. The module is connected to an, to an external pin. When a match occurs, one of several things may happen depending on the setting. Okay, so that's what the compare mode does. And then you have also the principles of PWM. What is PWM? Well, a PWM is a pulse width modulated signal. Allows you to to get out an average. It's basically used to drive motors, things like that. Um, the the wider this pulse, the the higher the DC average of this voltage. You can see that the pulse with the wider the pulse width modulated signal with the wider pulse has a higher DC average value than than the signal. With the, with the thinner pulse width modulation. So this allows you to drive a motor or something like that either faster or slower. 
and it's a very efficient way of driving a motor. And uh, this kind of just shows you an example. A motor is usually modeled by an inductor. So you basically control uh, the speed of the motor by the on time of the signal. Okay, so if you need to drive a motor or something like that, then the PWM is something that you really would want to research and try to learn a little bit more about. Okay, let's talk a little bit about serial ports. Okay, synchronous data communication. If you want to transfer data uh, from your PIC to another chip, you want to communicate serially with uh, a sensor or another microprocessor or anything like that, then you're, you're probably going to want to research a little bit about the serial ports. Now, synchronous, synchronous means that you're going to have a clock. So that's the difference. We're going to talk about two types of serial communication, synchronous and asynchronous. The synchronous has a clock. Okay, so what, that's what the word synchronous means, is you're going to have a, have a clock signal, which means you're going to have at least two pins, a data and a clock. <coughs> Okay, so we have this master synchronous serial port module on the PICs, and that's what we use to communicate with serial data. Now we can we can use SPI or I squared C. Sometimes the I squared C is, is written like this, or, or sometimes they write it as I2C. Either way, it's the same thing. If whatever device you're using says I2C or SPI, something like that, then you're going to need to learn a little bit more about how the serial ports work on the PIC microcontrollers. And that's going to be in chapter 10 of your textbook. There's a, there's a configuration register that you're going to use to, con to configure that uh, serial, the SPI mode. And this is an example of, of what the synchronous data would look like in the clock. So you have a clock and then you have, you have the data. <coughs> Now I squared C, if you have an application where you need to use I squared C, uh, I squared C is, a, is quite a bit more advanced than SPI. And you can read again your textbook on chapter 10 to learn a lot more about I squared C. Basically, it's, uh, it allows you to address other devices. So the SPI is, just, you know, there's no address and you can't really decide or pick which uh, you can't string a lot of devices on it and then pick which device you want to choose. You, um, but on I squared C, it gives you the ability to, to do some addressing, so you can have a, a lot of different devices on the same bus. That's one of the main advantages. There's some other advantages as well that you can read about. So this is a typical waveform for I squared C. You have a clock, you have data. Um, normally the clock and data are pulled high and you have like a start bit when it, when it goes low. Um, but you'll have to, there's lots of information about I squared C in the, in the textbook. You can read more. And here's an example waveform of what that would look like. <clears throat> Again, you have the registers. You have the SSPCon1 register, SSPSAT, SSPCon2 register that's going to use to configure those, that serial port register. Now we'll talk a little bit about asynchronous principles. Um, a lot of things, like uh, a lot of sensors, a, a lot of um, other microcontrollers, a lot of actually LCD modules, they don't have the parallel data anymore. They have just a single line. That's the advantage of having the asynchronous. Now, asynchronous basically means uh, with no clock. That's, that's a pretty simple definition of what asynchronous would mean. You don't have a clock signal. You have only have one line, and it acts as both clock and data. I guess in one word, it means that you, basically the chip sending the information has has to um, the chip receiving the information has to know exactly the pulse width that's being sent, and that's the way you do that's by you have to know the baud rate. So the, both the transmitting and receiving chip have to be set for the exact same baud rate. Otherwise, the data communication will not work. Whereas if you have a, 
a synchronous communication, you don't really have this, you don't have to tell both devices the same baud rate. That doesn't really matter. So in asynchronous, you, again, you have this start bit. Um, and then once you send the start bit, that's how the, the chips synchronize the data. They synchronize the data by, um, once you get a start bit, it has to know the baud rate. And then it tries to find the midpoint, and it just sets the timing up so it captures the data right in the midpoint of the signal. And then, of course, you have a stop bit. So that's how asynchronous works. Now, asynchronous is configured using the uh, the UART register. There's a on the PIC chips. There's a universal synchronous asynchronous receiver transmitter chip that you can use to do all the UART communication. Now, RS232 is an example of of a UART. That was the, the old serial standard on uh, the computers in the 80s and 90s. Before USB came out, everything was uh, serial ports were all like RS-232, RS-485. Here's uh, more of the register that's used to configure the UARTs. You'll have to learn a little bit more about that. I uh, just wanted to show you that they do exist and that there's, there's bits that you can read to configure those. And here's an example waveform of serial communication where you have the start bit, you have 10101100, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, and then you have your stop bit. Compared to I squared C data, which has a clock and a data, you can see. So that's the difference. UARTs only have one line of data, whereas a I squared C would have um, two clock and data. So. Now, finally, we'll talk about analog to digital converters. Anytime you have transducers, analog transducers on your in your project that you need to take that analog value and convert it to a digital value, uh, whether it's a magnometer, a pressure sensor. Uh, they make both digital and analog pressure sensors. So I know a lot of the transducers these days will have an SPI port that comes out, a UART port, or maybe analog. So if you want to go analog, then you're going to need to digitize that data if you want uh, your microprocessor to be able to use it. Sometimes you have to amplify it and offset it. You have to level shift it to the right levels if you do the analog route. The way the analog to digital converter works is it basically has a certain input ra range from, you know, typically from 0 to 5 volts. And the 5 volts will re re represent all 1s, and 0 volts will re represent all zeros, and then you have everything in between. So you get a value, something in between would give you a value in between, uh, you know, a midpoint value would give you a mid value in your digital code. So that's the way the analog to digital converter works. And uh, you have to make the decision. Uh, if you're going to do a transducer, just make the decision whether you want to go analog or digital. Either way, it's going to, it's going to be some work. Um, actually, the analog to digital converter would probably be the simplest route um, as far as configuration because it's, it's easier to configure the analog to digital converter than it is probably the, the serial but uh, you just have to make that determination. It really depends on what you have experience with. If you have no experience uh, I would just say do either one. Um, digital would probably be better from a noise standpoint definitely. Uh, digital would be the best way to go. So, <clears throat> But if you want to have something simple and you have a lot of, um, if you have a lot of them, then you could use uh, the analog to digital converter. It's, it's really, it's just your choice. There's pros and cons to, to both. The way the analog to digital conversion works is you configure and enable the analog to digital converter. You select the multiplexer input. So the analog to digital converter uh, has a multiplexer on it. It has like 8 or 10, depending inputs and you, you can only select and then the analog to digital converter sits here and this is analog input and then it has digital outputs. So this is analog and then you may have your transducers here and then you have to se select this is zero uh, sorry this is zero one two three four you have to select which channel you want and that goes into your analog to digital converter. Then you sample the input, 
you you usually delay, give a little bit of time for signal acquisition. You want to um, once you select a multiplier, you actually want to wait a little bit because there's going to be some settle time. And then you want to you know make sure you hold the input signal long enough to capture the value because your analog values they they change. So you want to make sure that your um, once you select the the mux value, then you allow your your input to settle. So this is the settle time. It may take there may be some time here for your to go from your five volts to your three volts level. So you need to the microprocessors are so fast you have to take into account that that time. So there's definitely going to be a delay macro needed when you use an analog to digital converter. Start your conversion, delay for conversion to be complete, and then read the data. A lot of times you have to just play around with the, de with the delay. You don't you don't want to have too much delay. You want to have just the right amount. And that's that's pretty much it. So there, I mean, there's a lot more involved in the analog to digital converters, but um, really. The purpose for these slides is for you to determine whether you need to use something or not, and then if you have something that has an analog value, then um, you're going to need to use an analog to digital converter. So that's it. Hopefully this will give you a good starting point for picking um, what devices, what peripherals you need in your, in your project, and help you make a decision on what you need to research further. Thanks, and I'll see you for the next lesson.